Today's program starts off in the foothills of the Rockies, on the border between British Columbia and Alberta, where, over the years, there have been numerous sightings of Sasquatch, also known as Bigfoot. And we go to North Carolina's Great Dismal Swamp, a vast, watery wilderness where for centuries numerous ghosts from times past have been seen. And we'll visit the old Customs House in Hamilton, Ontario, a building with a colorful past whose ghostly inhabitants continue to make their presence known. The Rocky Mountains in Canada are a hot spot for Sasquatch sightings. Do these massive, hairy, man-like creatures really exist? Just ask any of the hundreds of people who believe they have encountered one or heard its eerie howl in the wilderness. A friend of mine and I were walking outside of the uh, camp down along the stream, and we were worried about um, falling into the holes, so that's what we were talking about, watching the ground. And all of a sudden we heard some noises, some branches breaking, like up, though, up in the tree. So we looked up in the tree with our flashlights and shone them around a little bit, and all of a sudden we caught sight of this thing that was, could have been a bear, but it wasn't a bear. It ended up, it was big. It was like seven foot tall, and it looked like an ape type of thing. And it had Irish setter kind of hair, that even that kind of texture, that length. And um, it even had a sort of a smell to it. And uh, it was scary looking, but uh, all of a sudden it jumped out of the tree, right down in front of us. And uh, we decided to move for a second, afraid. It seemed like it was going to lunge almost, and, but it didn't. Then it seemed almost like it wasn't aggressive. So we, um, we took off anyway. We started running, and as we were running, it was running the other way, but screaming, making a screaming noise, like as if it was a woman being murdered. Freaky sound. That's what it sounded like of a woman being murdered or maybe a baby crying, real, real unusual sounding. Never heard anything like it before. Never saw anything like it before. Almost everybody who's seen Bigfoot says the same thing. It's a giant. It's covered in hair, not fur, hair. And it has no neck and walks with a distinctive rolling gait. And it runs as fast as a horse. But when it leaves, it leaves something special behind, an intense, disagreeable stench. I've been actively researching the Sasquatch question since about 1979. That'd be about 27 years. But I've been obsessed with this uh, ongoing mystery ever since I was old enough to read. The most interesting uh, pair of these castings is the ones that I've been called the Bosberg Cripple, because you're looking at the bottom of the feet here. And you can see by the distortion in the foot that this is a crippled individual. Now, the anatomy suggested by the two bulges on the other edge suggests that this was a foot designed with different leverage. In other words, this is the way a human foot would be designed if it was natural for humans to weigh between 600 and 800 pounds. One of the most remarkable Sasquatch encounters occurred in the early 1900s. Albert Osterman was a lumberman on a camping trip. A native trail guide had warned him about a legendary hairy creature called a Sasquatch, but Osterman didn't give it much thought. His first night at camp was disturbed repeatedly by sounds around his campsite. Osterman assumed it was just wildlife and eventually ignored it. A few nights later, Osterman went out for some night hunting. When he got back to camp, he discovered his campsite had been ransacked. It didn't appear to be the work of ordinary animals, but there were no humans around for miles. Shortly afterward, he discovered just what had been stalking his campsite. The creature had picked him up in his sleeping bag and dragged him for three hours to a small cave where he was eventually dumped in a heap. His kidnapper was a beast more than eight feet tall.
When Osterman regained consciousness, he discovered he had not just one captor, but an entire colony of the giant hairy creatures. It's, it's all right. Osterman tried to it's flee, right. but his kidnapper would not allow him to escape, standing guard over Please. him and the entire lair. The terrified Please. man was never harmed by these creatures. They seemed more curious than threatening, even sharing their food with Osterman, who by now was hungry enough to accept. Uh. For six days and nights, Osterman was a prisoner to this colony of Sasquatch. Then Osterman thought of an escape plan. Wait. Look. Look. Taste. He took out his tobacco tin and took a small pinch then offered the tin to the creature, who swallowed its entire contents, and eventually became violently ill. Osterman seized the moment to make his escape. He didn't tell anyone about his experience for 30 years, afraid no one would believe him. The maps you're looking at right here are north, or northern and southern Alberta maps, and these are all instances that I've personally looked into. The blue pins are sighting reports, the red pins are footprint findings, and the numbers you see on each pin indicates which file the, the, this particular instance is associated with. I spent 24 years researching the Sasquatch in uh, western Alberta and eastern British Columbia before I moved uh, to Mission British Columbia. Well, a few years ago, my boyfriend Lex and I decided that we were going to go on a camping trip for, for the weekend. So we packed up our dog King and headed to the Alberta woods. A few hours into the trip, it was getting pretty cold and getting pretty dark, so we found a good spot and set up camp. We headed into the tent and laid down for a little while, but it just seemed a little too quiet, you know? So we peeked our head out of the tent and it was the weirdest thing. King was just staring off into the woods, really, really quiet, with this blank look on his face. hear anything so we thought nothing of it and went back to bed but then in the middle of the night King was going crazy just barking and jumping and what could it have been then all of a sudden we heard a yelp and then it was silent that same silence again so we went out of the tent and so we went out of the tent and all we saw was blood and bones. Thought maybe it was a grizzly bear. Or what else could there have been in the woods at that time? But then Lex looked down. What he saw was a huge almost like a human footprint in the snow. I didn't believe in them before, but I definitely do now. And I know that it was a Sasquatch that took our king. In 1957, William Rowe came closer than any other witness to the creature in the mountains west of Jasper. He made a sworn affidavit to an Edmonton official shortly afterwards. This is a transcript of his testimony. My first impression was of a huge man, about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, weighing somewhere near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot with dark brown hair. He was very close, with ears shaped like a human's, with eyes small and dark like a bear's, and a neck thicker and shorter than any human. I watched him closely as he stripped a branch of its leaves. Then he caught my scent. He looked surprised and backed off, not afraid, just not wanting contact. 
I leveled my rifle thinking I would have a specimen of great interest to scientists the world over. But when the retreating creature turned and looked at me, I lowered my weapon. I would never forgive myself for shooting something that seemed so human. My, this is all speculation based on eyewitness reports, but I tend to think there is, for every hundred bear in every given area, there's probably one Sasquatch. Uh, anywhere between 200 and 2,000 between the Rockies and the West Coast. My buddy and I were hiking in the woods when there was something in the bushes about 40 feet away. I heard this whistle like I've never heard before. It was human-like, but very commanding. And then that's when this creature come out on its two legs, six or seven feet tall, covered with hair. This is so weird, but we saw a second one. It was big and hefty, over seven feet tall, just as hairy as the other one, and it was walking towards some trees. Everybody told me what I saw was probably a bear, but no way. It was walking on its hind legs, it was huge, and it was hairy. It was not a bear. Without a doubt, it was a Bigfoot. Definitely a Bigfoot. Now, the Rocky Mountains of Alberta, even though they don't have the, the, the volume of reports that we do here in the west coast of British Columbia, there is a long history of reporting encounters with the Sasquatch in and around the Rockies of Alberta. And the most common area in Alberta seems to be north and south of Highway 11 between Rocky Mountain House and Banff National Park in and around the Bighorn Dam. And uh, hopefully one day before too long, we'll find an answer to this mystery and solve this question once and for all. Coming up next, the ghosts who haunt North Carolina's Great Dismal Swamp. The Great Dismal Swamp is a natural wonder, spanning two states and covering 600 square miles. It is beautiful, mysterious, and also deadly. Over the years, hundreds of people have entered the swamp, never to come out again. To this day, there are places where no human being has set foot, and other places where people wished they hadn't set foot. I was up by the Great Dismal Swamp, and I was, I was in one of the feeder ditches, and, and there was this beautiful Native American woman coming toward me. Rowing ever so gracefully in a canoe. And I remembered it, it was the legend of the Lady in the Lake. And I was glad I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to sit there and see it coming towards me. It was incredible. I'll never forget it. They made her grave too cold and damp for a soul so warm and true. And now she's gone to the lake of the dismal swamp, where all night long, by a firefly lamp, she paddles her bark canoe. These words penned a hundred years ago by Thomas More describe the most famous ghost of the dismal swamp, the Lady of the Lake. But she's just one of the many strange phenomena associated with this immense wilderness area. One of the most famous stories from the Great Dismal Swamp is one that's been passed down as an Indian legend for hundreds of years. It's about a young maiden and a young brave who were to be married. Everyone was looking forward to this wedding because it was the perfect union. Before the wedding date, however, the young maiden became ill and she died. So when it came time for wedding day, the tribe instead had a funeral. The maiden was taken out near one of her favorite spots where she could overlook the lake of the Dismal Swamp. Later, the brave had fallen asleep 
and in his dreams, she had come to him, calling to him from a tree that stood near the spot where she was buried. He didn't know what to make of this dream, so he ventured into the swamp to the spot where she lay. He fell asleep there, and again, she came to him in a dream, calling to him to come across the lake to be with her. He brought back a canoe, and he set out into the lake to try to find his bride. The young brave was never seen again. He did not return. But for the past 100 years, visitors to the swamp have seen the brave and his bride in a canoe paddling across the lake of the dismal swamp. Here we are about to enter the uh, Washington Ditch Trail. This, takes us, this will take us right into the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, most of the swamp is inaccessible by foot, but this is one of the prime locations to, to go ahead and enter the swamp, especially at night. The reason that we want to focus our investigation on Washington Ditch Trail is because of the numerous sightings of ghosts that have been reported in and around this area. Um, I can say, I can definitely say it's very creepy out tonight, and I'm looking forward to getting out and actually seeing something. All right, what I want to do before we go ahead and start down the trail is I want to calibrate both of the devices I'm going to be using tonight. Um, the first of the two is a, this is a standard off-the-shelf stud finder. And now if anything comes in, in close proximity to that, it's going to let me know. And ghosts, if ghostly apparitions actually do have, uh, you know, some form to them, some density to them, this is going to be the tool that will pick that up. The other tool I'm using is a standard uh, IR temperature gun. This way, I, if we think that there's something going on, maybe we hear something in the woods or, or you just don't feel right, or maybe you feel a cold chill, we can go ahead and um, point this out into the woods, get a reading on it, and determine whether or not there's anything there. But before we actually step out in the woods, I'm going to calibrate it by getting a baseline reading. And the baseline reading I'm getting right now is about 61 degrees. Sixty-three. 63.4, 63.3, 63.4, 63.3, 64.3, 64.5, 64.2. Well, there's a possibility that there is something out there. The Great Dismal Swamp has a rich legacy of ghostly legends dating back hundreds of years and passed on through the generations. Are these just folklore, or are they true? When I first came to the swamp 30-some years ago, it was still a privately owned piece of land before it became a national wildlife refuge. I had the opportunity to meet many of the old-timers here who had hunted and fished for many, many years. And they very often had a lot of interesting stories to tell about the swamp. One night, uh, in early evening, a good biologist friend of mine uh, came up to my house, and he was obviously very agitated and, and worried, and he had just been down to the swamp on Washington Ditch. As he rounded the corner uh, to the last little bit to get to the lake, he was rather astonished to see two people walking ahead of him toward the lake. Uh, he thought it was very strange because he hadn't passed any cars on the way and he was um, coming up on them, of course, to tell them that it was, a, was not a good idea to be in here. He noticed that they were wearing very odd clothes and uh, he described the, the man as having a fishing pole. So the other very strange thing was that the woman had a dress on, which he found very astonishing because women didn't usually go hiking in their dresses. As he drove up to tell them that they shouldn't be in there or to help them in any way he could, they vanished. As he was telling us this story, I remembered the legend of the, uh, the fisherman who was lost in the swamp with his bride. And I, it sounded very much, the description that he gave was of these two people is the very interesting thing was that he never had heard that story or read about that legend in his life so he had no idea that what he'd actually seen 
was actually ghosts from an old legend. Years ago, there was a young lady that lived on the edge of the swamp. And on her wedding day, her groom-to-be had gone into the swamp to go fishing and bring back the meat for the table for that night after the wedding. It came time for the wedding, and the groom did not reappear. And they all became very worried about it. Well, still decked out in her wedding gown, she went into the swamp looking for her husband to be. Well, no one ever saw her again or the groom. But to this day, fishermen who come into the swamp early in the morning will see a lady on the southern shore fishing, decked out in her bright white wedding gown. If they try to approach her by boat, she disappears into a white mist, and the mist hangs over the water. It was early in the morning. Uh, I think it was around 4 AM. I couldn't sleep that morning. So I just decided to uh, jump into the boat and go down the swamp and uh, throw a few lines in and see if I could get something. We went out there, and there wasn't a soul in sight. Again, it was 4 in the morning. And, uh, I see this beautiful woman wearing a white dress. And believe it or not, she was fishing as well. Actually, it looked like a wedding dress. Again, there was no one around us, and um, I thought it was pretty weird of her being there in a white dress fishing. And she noticed me, she smiled. So, of course, I paddled a little ways past her, and um, I just happened to look back, and um, she was gone. Uh, looked around a little bit to see if I could find out where she had went. No signs of movement or anything, and uh, it really freaked me out. One minute she's there, the next minute she's gone. Never forget it. Okay. New ambient temperature is 58 degrees. Well, my stud finder went off. It was on number two there indicating this, whatever it was was fairly close, that something did actually set it off. Set off meaning that there was something dense enough in front of it to trigger it. 62.2. Number 63 is the uh, fluctuation range I'm going for right now. The needle is not pointing north. The needle is not pointing north. It means there's some kind of magnetic disturbance that is forcing it to go a different way than north. Usually that magnetic disturbance involves a ghost, something paranormal related. 62.9, uh, that's within the range. With all the ghost sightings that have happened in this area and the numerous deaths, violent deaths, tragic deaths that have occurred in this area, it could be anything. It could be something trying to reach out to us, some long lost soul that wants to make contact with the living. Maybe they don't even know they're dead. You notice it came from back there, and then as we continued walking, I got no adverse readings. Get to this point, adverse reading. Either it's moving on, or it's staying just, be, just out of our range, trying to follow us. After the break, a tale of French pirates killed in the swamp. I was hunting in the Great Dismal Swamp for probably two or three hours when I, I started to hear some voices, uh, noise, long way out. So I started hiking, getting out towards that area. Got over towards the point there, and I know I heard voices. And as I got closer to them, they were, I knew it wasn't English, but as I got closer, I, I believe it was French. It sounded like quite a few. So as I, I, I kept going towards that area, and I, I got to the area, and there was no one there. It, 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 there was nobody, and the voices stopped. It was incredible, really. It is said that early in the 19th century, a French pirate ship that had raided gold in the Caribbean 
was chased up to the eastern coast by the British. In order to evade them, they went up into the canals of the Great Dismal Swamp. When the British followed them up, they came to the ship, but there was no one left on board. They then went into the swamp to try to find the pirates, and they eventually located them. But the treasure and the gold was not to be found anywhere. The British soldiers killed all of the pirates, but it is said that several of them may have escaped into the swamp. I'll lock your head off now. Where's the gold? To this day, at dusk, if you listen carefully, you may be able to hear the pirates sitting around their campfire discussing their treasure, speaking in French. But the treasure has never been found. I, I think I just heard something. It seemed to come from back where we just came from. I thought I heard something fall out of that tree or, or ra ruffled the tree, the tree leaves. Got something on there. Something on the stuff from there. Oh, oh, wow. We're way off now. All right. The compass is now way off base. You're right now way off base. You're right there. I got a slight reading on the stud finder. The compass appears to be getting more and more off of north. Something is definitely out here. 59, 59.6. I, I, I want to go over this. I want to go over the. Something, something's got to be out here. I don't know if it's following us or what, but something has got to be out here. There's no telling what could be out here. 60, 60.6. I can't say if it's something about this tree um, or if something happened in this general area or if this apparition is, in fact, just following us. Overall, I think we have experienced probably, at the very least, ghostly activity that played wreaked havoc with the, com with the compass that we used and gave us some strange, generally out of the ordinary temperature readings why the apparition chose this night, this place, us, I can't say for sure. What, it's, what it wants to do, what its methods are, I have no idea. But I can say that something was definitely here tonight. The swamp is an undisturbed wilderness, a tangle of cypress trees and vines. It's an easy place to get lost in if you aren't careful. But there are also places in the swamp that appear and then disappear. This is beautiful sitting here reminiscing about that hike I took about a year ago. Got to hiking through and I saw this little cemetery in the middle of nowhere. So beautiful, so serene. I said to myself, my girlfriend would really like this. It was cemetery plots from the 1800s. So I looked around, I marked it on my GPS, I put it in my book took my bandana, I tied it up on the, on the tree, and I knew I was coming back there. Grabbed my girlfriend. Next day, I was all excited. I knew she'd love this. She loves things like this. We looked around. There was, there was nothing I couldn't understand. I was, I was shocked. Just yesterday, there was a headstone. There was a graveyard. There was a beautiful, serene cemetery here. I couldn't understand. I double-checked. I checked my GPS. I had the right grid coordinates. And I just, I wanted to make sure because this is nowhere to get stuck in the dismal swamp. I looked around, there was nothing there. I knew there was a cemetery, I knew there was a headstone. The only thing left was my bandana. I, so I knew I wasn't crazy, but I knew something had gone wrong. And I knew I had to get out of the great dismal swamp. I didn't want both of us to be stuck there. Travis McHenry has come to the swamp in search of another kind of creature. He's been tracking Bigfoot sightings in the swamp. The area in and around the Great Dismal Swamp has been the location of several Bigfoot sightings over the past 20 years. We also found footprints, two separate footprints. One was a 15-inch track, uh, which we found in the mud, and that was 
pretty apparently a Bigfoot track, 15 inches is about the average size. I had the liberty of being able to make a plaster cast of the footprint I found that day. This is a plastic recreation of that, and as you can see, I've drawn in the uh, bones, uh, reconstructed where the bones would be on the Bigfoot's foot. People usually find footprints that are 15 inches long, and that is uh, commonly associated with Bigfoot activity. Based on the numerous footprints, eyewitness reports, and the sounds which I myself have heard, I am very confident that there is a Bigfoot creature or a group of Bigfoot creatures either living in the Dismal Swamp or using the Dismal Swamp as some kind of migration uh, point. The Great Dismal Swamp is a fierce, untamable wilderness that has withstood the attempts of humans to control it. It's a protected wilderness area, so it continues to grow wild keeping its secrets safe inside the tangle of vines and brush that grow in its murky waters. Coming up next, the ghosts who haunt Hamilton's old customs house. The customs house in Hamilton, Ontario was built in 1860 to handle the trade from the port and the new great railway line. It is one of the city's oldest and most majestic buildings. It also happens to be one of its most haunted. Its oldest resident ghost is known as the Dark Lady. I used to go to the Murray Street School back in the 1940s. This particular day, it was really cold, so a couple of friends and I decided to go and eat our lunch in the stairwell at the Customs House. Something just caught my eye and I just happened to look up and I saw this lady. She was all dressed in old fashioned clothes and she looked so sad and lonely and I just couldn't take my eyes off her for a while. But then she disappeared and I just rushed out screaming back to the school. I was really terrified. I've since talked to my friends and to this day, they've never heard or seen this lady. But it was really, really terrifying at the time. In its heyday, the Hamilton Customs House employed 17 men to collect the duty on goods brought in by longshoremen, sailors, railwaymen, and teamsters who came through there every day. More recently, it's been an army recruiting center, a macaroni factory, a flop house, a martial arts center. In 1995, it became the Workers' Heritage Center. But it's a museum with ghostly inhabitants. The legend of the Dark Lady begins in England. A young girl who was living in a small community in the middle of England was raped and she decided to move here to Canada. During her voyage aboard a ship, she met the captain of the vessel and the two began a long love affair over the many weeks it took to get from England to Canada at that time. Now, for quite a while, no one knew about the love affair between the two until crew and passengers alike began to see this love affair taking place in the dark corners of the vessel. By the time they had reached Hamilton, he knew that he had to put an end to any possibility of more rumors beginning due to the fact of his upstanding position as a captain of a ship and his family back home in England. So when they arrive at the customs house, he takes her down into the basement, strangles her to death. And takes her into a room now affectionately known as the vault, where he spends the rest of the day walling her body up. To this day, an image in dark clothing is seen roaming around these hallways and has been for well over 100 years. The paranormal investigators from Haunted Hamilton have come to the Customs House hoping to make contact with, or at least document, the spirits people claim to have encountered. You guys picking up anything yet? 
actually you're standing in a sensitive spot. There's a woman running up and down these stairs. You see her? I can see she's looking for a child, calling out for a child. Is that the little boy that's been seen on the steps now? Yes. Oh, cool. He sits on the stairs here peeking through. And it said there's a step up there, and it's wheeled away the most, and that's where he's been spotted sitting there with his head in his hands. Yeah. Several people have seen him up there. And the temperature's going up too. It's 55, 5, 55, 6, 7, 8. Are you here with us right now? Are you hiding from your mom? Looks like it. Wow. Can you hear? Yeah, I can. Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear that. He wants to show us something upstairs in the attic. His mother's not the same woman from this room, is she? The one who was uh, abused in this room? Uh, I don't think no. So. No. No, it was somebody who worked here, was a servant in this house. History bears out the paranormal team's experience. A servant girl did indeed die in the house in a particularly horrible way. She was decapitated. She had prepared a meal and was about to send it up in the building's dumbwaiter. She summoned the waiter down to the kitchen and waited. After what seemed like an unusually long time, she opened the hatch and poked her head in to see what was causing the delay. At that instant, an unknown person cut through the rope pulley and sent the elevator hurtling down, severing the kitchen maid's head. I don't get hurt in here at all. Really? This is the pendulum board. The pendulum board's the same way as the mining rods. You ask it yes, no sort of questions and watch it spin different ways to answer. With a pendulum board, you can get more defined answers. Is there really a dark lady in this house? Was she really buried in this room? No. See, we knew it. Maybe later we can go out with divining rods and see if we can figure out where exactly yeah, she is. Or we can we gonna find some activity upstairs? Should we go up to the attic? All right, let's go. The tale of two painters takes place in the second floor hallway at the customs house. Two painters are painting one portion of a wall. And as one painter is painting, he sees in his wet paint the word murder slowly being spelled. In shock, he tries to cover that word up with more paint, but still it persists and seeps back through. He calls over his friend to see what he is seeing before his eyes. But by the time he does, that word, murder, had erased itself. Yeah, I feel somebody's up around the corner. Just around the corner there. It's a lady. Yes. Guess she's what? Gonna... Pardon? Yes, she's gonna hurt us or somebody else. She is? She's afraid of you. She thinks you're gonna send her away. We're not gonna send you away. Another event that this construction crew endured involved screws. The carpenters needed more supplies, so they went downstairs in search of more screws. 
as they went into the room where they were kept. They looked about and could not find the boxes that they should be in. It wasn't until one of those men peered down to the floor that he found the screws. But it's not where the screws were found that is important. It's their position. For as the men gazed down upon the floor beneath them, they saw the screws spelling out words such as death, murder, kill, and so forth. One of many events that this construction crew would endure during their time here at the customs house. You go see your man to go up in the attic? You really want to? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. What is that? They're not in there. <laughs> They're not in there. No. They're upstairs. They're upstairs. They're upstairs. They're upstairs. Are they here? They better be here. No. You okay? No. But if you pressed it. If nobody pressed it, somebody would have had to actually been in there and push second floor for it to come here, right? Yeah. yeah. If those if those people down below were using it, it would have just stayed down there. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take the elevator up to the attic? No. Many events also take place to people whom just visit this customs house. Such as that of a woman. She came into the lobby, and on the main staircase she saw a girl seated battered and bruised. She went over to the young girl to see what was wrong, but before she could make it there, that girl disappeared. That night she has a dream. She's back here at the customs house, except this time down in the basement. And she sees that same girl, standing alone in a room, bruised and beaten still. And then from behind her, a man begins to attack her. The woman having this dream intervenes. She is then tackled by the man where she wakes up. investigation where something fell on me when I asked it to, so I'm impressed. We know nobody hit the button on the elevator, so that's interesting that it showed up at our floor. This has been a lot more colorful. I mean, when I go on investigations, we do the same sort of routine, walking around asking for signs, sensing what's there. Mm -hmm. um, we've never Very had difficult. such obvious manifestations. The Hamilton Customs House has suffered fire and flood and an assortment of tenants. But throughout its history, it has been home to the phantom spirits of its past.